We are in John 6, verse 15 through 21. If you weren't with us last week, I'll give you a reminder. This last Sunday was the fourth sign. Remember, John has given us several signs that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The fourth sign was last Sunday, the feeding of what we would call the 20,000. It may have been a whole lot more than that, but I would not guess it was any less than that. And showing us a sign that Jesus can and does miraculously provide for people. And I, I don't want you to miss this as we're covering the life of Christ, that you need to see the connections he has with Moses. Because I'm talking to a bunch of Gentiles in all likelihood, you may not have the connections that you should by studying the Old Testament, that Jesus is the new and better Moses. And the Jews would need to see this in order to trust in him. Uh, last week, we took a look at bread from heaven. Remember, they had this manna that came from heaven. And Jesus in this chapter is going to refer to himself as the bread of heaven. You thought Moses had something going on. Oh, no, this is much better. Another connection we'll see with Moses is you remember in the Old Testament how Moses parted the water. It was God doing it. But through the staff of Moses, he helped protect the people because he pulled out the staff and the Red Sea split apart so Israel could go through on dry land. And what do we see in this fifth um, sign? Jesus walks on water. He doesn't just split it. He walks on top of it. And so you need to see this better picture of, of the new Moses, the one who's leading the people into the promised land. And so we'll see today that Jesus protects his people, uh, and even in death, and we'll talk about that at the very end of this sermon, and secondly, he, that he has authority over all creation, even the sea, uh, which for some of you folks would make no difference. Well, of course he has authority over the sea, but no, at the first century, they looked at the sea, even as something as small as a lake, and was saying it was a place of chaos. You can't control the sea but only person that can control the sea would be God. Hello, that's what we see in this chapter as Jesus is walking on the sea because he controls it. And isn't this what we need to see when the storms of life hit us? Is that someone is out there that actually walks on water in these storms of life and he can be trusted. Charles Spurgeon, the 19th century preacher, put it this way, your extremity is God's opportunity. The difficulty all along has been to get to the end of you. For when a man gets to the end of himself, he has reached the beginning of God's working. God is working the entire time. But oftentimes it takes so long for us to get to the end of ourselves to realize that I can't do this. God has been showing us all along, you can't do this, you can't do this, you cannot do this. And then we get to the point, oh, I, I guess I can't. We're so thick-headed. And at times like that, Jesus comes walking in on water, and that's exactly what we need to see today. So this is the word of God. Uh, Jesus has just uh, fed the 20,000, and what do you figure the people want to do? They want to make him king. Verse 15 of chapter 6. Perceiving then that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Uh, there's an interesting verb there that says that they were going to come take him by force. It's this Greek word harpazo. Harpazo. And it means to seize by force, to snatch up suddenly. Jesus knew it. They were starting to make a move towards him. Like, we're just gonna, we will make him king. We're not gonna ask his opinion. He will be our king. And this is Greek word harpazo. It's uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. You know it well. It says that uh, at the time of the return of Christ, we who are still here will be what? Caught up together with him in the clouds, with them in the clouds. So we shall be forever with the Lord. That's our word here is they're about to harpazo him and make him king. So Christ does not take this kingship. 
And you have to ask the question, why doesn't Christ accept the kingship? I mean, he's king. He might as well be accepted. Well, three issues are at hand. Number one, it's the wrong type of kingship. Uh, The people want a miracle worker. They want a healer. They want a cook. They can make them really great bread and fish and a conqueror to kick out the Romans. And that's not the kingship that he is going to have at that coming. At his next coming, it will be. Number two, the people want a prophet and king. Remember, they said, is this the prophet that Moses spoke about? In the king, he'd be the Messiah? But what of Christ's third office? Remember, Christ has three offices. You'll hear prophet, king, but what's that other one? Priest. They're not interested in that third office. A priest who would offer up not a lamb, but himself as a lamb of God, as an atonement for their sins. And quite honestly, they're not interested. They don't want to deal with sin, as, as the world will tell you. We're not sinners. We do, we do okay. No, they don't want that. A uh, third reason why Christ does not accept the kingship is his time had not yet come. He will soon present himself as king at the Mount of Olives at the end of his ministry, but it's not gonna happen now. And note, if they now force him to the kingship, the authorities would have legal excuse to arrest Christ and his ministry's over. But the Lord is in charge of everything and even his own life. And so he says, nope, it ain't gonna happen today. So he goes to the mountain by himself. He's going to the mountain to pray. We don't see that in this text, but in Matthew and Mark's uh, rendition of it, he's going there to pray. Verse 16 and 17, when evening came, his disciples went to the sea, got into a boat and started across the sea to Capernaum. It was now dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. Now, as a kid, I often wondered, they call it the Sea of Galilee, but it's not that big. Why do they call it a sea? Why don't they call it a lake? That would make better sense to me. And perhaps some of you have thought that as well. You see, the word sea in English is typically referring to a really large body of water. Uh, The Caspian Sea over in Iran is big. Uh, The Mediterranean Sea is splitting Europe and Africa and Asia right there. It's big, it's huge. But in Greek, uh, the term sea can just connote kind of a larger body of water, like a lake, like the Sea of Galilee. Um, it's called the Sea of Galilee. I told you that. It's also called the Sea of Tiberias. It also could be go- called by an old name, the Sea of Kinnereth. The Sea of Kinnereth, um, it's that Hebrew word, uh, Kinnor or Kinneret, if you're looking for a good name for a son or daughter. Um, and actually, it's, it is a sweet name because it's, they, when they looked at the Sea of Galilee, they thought it looked like a, a U-shaped harp or lyre. And so uh, that's what it looked like. They called it the Sea of Harp or the Sea of uh, Liar. Um, so they thought it looked like that. That's free information. Let's go into it. They got into a boat and they started across the Sea of Capernaum. So they are traveling from the northeast to the northwest. They're traveling west. That will be key in a moment. All right. And uh, what we'll see is they have a boat. The boat could hold 15 people, and it was considered large, uh, 27 feet long, seven and a half feet wide. You know what's fascinating? One of these books have been found. Uh, You have those pictures up there in 1986. uh, There it is. Uh, That's what the top picture would be, what the boat would have looked like. Uh, There would have four men that would be on the oars, and you you had a mast. But the bottom picture is the one that was found in 1986. There's two Jewish brothers that are living in Israel, and they said, man, what we wouldn't give to find an ancient artifact. And wouldn't you know, they did. In 1986, there was a bad drought going on in Israel, and these two Jewish brothers discovered one of these boats in the mud in the Sea of Galilee. It had sat there for 2,000 years. Uh, they're certain of it, uh, that this boat is actually from the first century. Some people thought, could Jesus himself have sat in that boat? Yeah, the time frame uh, is indicative of that. They even call it the Jesus boat. 
I'm not saying that Jesus was in that boat, just to be clear, but it was that same time period. And uh, so I thought that was really interesting. Uh, so he, uh, they get into this boat. There's just 12 of them, it seems, at the time. And so Matthew and Mark add something else not in John, and that is that Christ had actually sent the multitudes away. When he knew that they were going to try to make him a king, he said, okay, we're done, folks. Y'all need to head on home. Teaching and the healing are over with. Y'all need to head out. And at that point also, in Matthew and Mark makes this clear, he made the disciples get into the boat. He, the term is he compelled them. He didn't just say, hey, y'all want to go for a boat ride? He said, y'all need to get in the boat. You need to head out for Capernaum. Well, I'm going to stay here and pray. Why does he make his disciples leave? That's very interesting, especially when you consider they're going to be going into these terrible winds. I like what one of the commentators stated, and I think he's right. He said, uh, Christ saw the crowds were in great excitement and were meaning to come and violently carry him off and declare him their king and Messiah in opposition to the civil power. Perhaps already Christ saw his disciples beginning to be caught up in that wild enthusiasm. Question, was it just the crowd that want to make Christ king or do his own disciples want to force this as well? Oh yeah, they certainly do. And so Christ may have seen that look in their eyes like, okay, it's time for y'all to get in the boat now and y'all are going to head out to Capernaum. It was now dark. John often uses that term darkness or night in order to describe ignorance or unbelief or a bad situation is occurring. But just to be very clear on this, getting into a boat on the Sea of Galilee at nighttime is not scary for the disciples. Uh, maybe you read that into the text in the past, but it's not. I mean, at least four of the 12 are fishermen. They spend all night out on the sea uh, many times fishing. So being out there in the dark is not an issue, okay? I'll show you a little bit more of that in a little while. Verse 18 and 19. The sea became rough because a strong wind was blowing. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and coming near the boat, and they were frightened. That's perhaps an understatement. Uh, the lake or Sea of Galilee, is 700, uh, 700 feet roughly below sea level. It is very, very susceptible to sudden violent storms or wind uh, that comes off the mountain range that is 4,000 feet above sea level. So it kind of, if you ever get on a, a mountain, you know it's a lot windier up top. And that's what happens is these winds from the mountains sweep down into the Sea of Galilee that's way below sea level, and it just starts churning. And that cold mountain air rushes down to the moist air coming off the surface of the lake, and you are prime for either bad storms or bad winds. As I told you earlier, they're headed across the lake to the west. Wouldn't you know the winds of the lake normally come from the west? And so they're going to be uh, rowing into the wind. Uh, you may remember a story about Jesus being in the boat with them. And do you remember what he's doing? He's sleeping. That's not this passage. That's an earlier passage. Uh, this is now the second time, though, that Jesus' uh, ministry where they're caught in strong winds or storms. Last time, Jesus did fall asleep in the boat. That proves that he's man as well as God. And they said to him, verse uh, chapter eight of uh, Matthew, uh, save us, Lord, we are perishing. In that situation, y'all, you should note, they were terrified. They were terrified. In this situation, they're not terrified yet. They will be, but for right now, they're, I get the idea that they're incredibly frustrated incredibly frustrated. They've been rowing perhaps six to eight hours and they got in the boat because Jesus told them to get in the boat. Um, and once again, though, it's important to note at least four of them are repeated or rather experienced fishermen. They know how to deal with winds. They've, they make their living on the lake. 
So even the winds don't scare them, but they're just, you get the idea they're frustrated because they've been rowing for six to eight hours. How do I know that? Well, the screen will show you Mark chapter six, verse 48, which tells that same story. And it says, and he, meaning Christ, saw that they were making headway painfully for the wind was against them. And about the fourth watch he, uh, of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He meant to pass by them. We'll stop there. Some of y'all are more negative-minded. Some of you are more positive. But there's different ways to look at these verses, right? Uh, You could say negatively, he saw them in their struggle. Or you can look at it positively and say, he saw them in their struggle. Negatively, you might say, He didn't come till the fourth watch of the night, which is three to 6 a.m. Or maybe those that are a little more positive would say, he came to them. Makes a difference, does it not? But then when you get to that third issue, he meant to pass by them. Now the positive and the negative people go, he meant to pass by them? You get the idea he saw them And the Bible is very clear. He saw them from the mountains struggling. He saw them for some time struggling, six to eight hours perhaps. And so at this point, he's like, I'm just going to walk this way, past them. (sighs) What does that mean? Can I give you three possible ways to interpret this phrase? One would be this. The night was ending and Christ wanted to get back to the shore before daylight so that a crowd would not be there. So he's thinking of the bigger picture here. He knows that these people, at least one third of the crew are fishermen. They're used to dealing with winds. It's fine. So he's just trying to get to the shore because he knows once the people show up, they're all gonna come in for healing and for things of this nature, which he will do, but it's important for him to get there. I don't think that's right. Some would say it's a second option. This is the perspective of the disciples. As the disciples saw him out there, they're terrified, as we'll see in a moment, but it almost looks like he's walking right past them, like, hey, we're here. Could be that. I really think it's the third option. And for those that know their Old Testament as well as they should, by the way, I didn't catch this either. (laughs) It was convicting. But this is Old Testament language, y'all. This is the biblical language. What does it mean by pass by? This is actually referring, I believe, to a theophany. A theophany is what some people would call the pre-incarnate Christ, where he wrestles with Jacob, where he is with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire. That means before he took on flesh, he was there with them. This is a theophany, a visible manifestation of God. Uh, In the language of Old Testament text, it said God passes by. He passes by. Why? To to give them assurance he's with them, for them to get comfort, to show his glory. Can I take you back to a couple of Old Testament characters? Not that I need your permission, but it's nice to ask. (laughs) Exodus 33, we have Moses, and God has just told him, basically, I'm not going with you people. And Moses says, you have to come. If you don't come with us, I mean, uh, people will say bad things about you. And and so at a certain point, God says, I will come. And Moses says, please do what? Show me your glory. Show me your glory. And God said, I will make all my glory pass before you and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. I will pass before you. This is a picture of God that's gonna pass before your eyes. We see it with another guy in the Old Testament, Elijah. You remember the story? Uh, He's on Mount Carmel. They've just had a, he just had an incredible victory. And God had fire come down from heaven and, and eviscerated the sacrifice. And then Elijah said, let's kill the prophets of Baal and kill the prophets of of Asherah. And that's what they do. This is a win, I think. And then the rain comes down as, as he prays, but then he gets one word from Jezebel that says, may the gods do to me and more so. If you don't end up just like 
the men you just killed. And all of a sudden, out of nowhere, Elijah's scared to death. Boy, I'm so glad we're not like him. (laughs) He takes off to go south. He goes further south than even Israel proper itself. He goes to Mount Horeb. And it says in chapter 19 of 1 Kings, verse 9 through 11, there Elijah came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? To use the military term, you're AWOL, buddy. You can't, you can't leave the job. You're a prophet. But God had such tremendous mercy upon him. But Elijah says, says I've been very jealous for the God, the, uh, for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with a sword. And I, even I only, am left. That's not true. And they seek my life to take it away. And God said, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. I'm of the firm belief this is Old Testament language. God's showing us something. The text is showing us something if we knew our Bibles better. Jesus is going to give them a visible manifestation of himself. He is God, and he's coming to them in the storms of life on the water. They had rowed three or four miles. In the Greek, it says 25 or 30 stadia. Since you don't know Greek measurements any better than I do, a stadion was 607 feet, so they figured that one out. But for us, it's three or four miles. At its widest point in this lake, it was seven miles. So they're right smack dab in the middle. Uh, how long had they been rowing? As I told you, perhaps six to eight hours, because he doesn't come till the fourth watch of the night, which is three to six a.m. And then it begs the question, or perhaps makes you think of the question: Why does the Lord delay in our troubles? You don't have to raise your hand, but in your mind, would anybody ever ask that question? Why is the Lord delaying? <laughs> well, you need to read the Psalms. How many times the psalmist asked that? Perhaps you could ask Mary, Martha, and Lazarus when you get to John 11, but we're not there yet. You can read it on your own. Many reasons why God delays. To test our faith, make us more like his son. One reason is so that we would learn obedience through suffering. And you might think, I wish I could learn obedience without suffering. I do too, Completely with you. But consider Jesus Christ himself in Hebrews 5, 8, that he was a son. He learned obedience through what he suffered. How can the God of the universe learn anything? Perhaps we would say that he learned it experientially as a human, that he learned obedience through suffering. Hebrews 12, 11 says, for the moment, all discipline seems painful but rather, rather than pleasant. But later it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness those who have been trained by it. Too often, y'all, we look at the word discipline and we think that means I'm, I'm, I'm getting a whooping or whatever you may use. No, discipline oftentimes is, is not correctional. It's just, it's where we get our word discipline. Uh, rather, um, sorry, it's where we get uh, our word to be a disciple, God is, has you training. He is training you in this life for the next life. You're in training. What sort of athlete doesn't expect to run hard or lift? He has to. That's the way he gets better. That's the way the Lord is training us. And so this is what's happening here. And I give you three applications in the midst of their, this rowing. I think you need to note this. In the midst of trouble, did you catch what the disciples keep doing? They keep rowing. A.W. Pink mentions this. Um, He had said, um, often in trials, we get so frustrated. We throw down our oars and we complain. And that's not what the disciples are doing. They keep on rowing. The Lord has you there on purpose. So stay at your post. Do not quit. Others have gone through this before. Salvation is coming Wait for it. One of my favorite verses, Psalm 27, 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. It's bookended with wait. And you go, but I hate waiting. And I go, I do too. 
Who loves waiting? Who is that person? Another application in the midst of this is that, remember, the Lord is the one who put them in the boat. He put them there. This is not a Jonah episode where Jonah's running from the Lord and so God sends a storm. No, they're in the will of God. They're doing the will of the Lord. And God says, and this is part of the will of the Lord, is the winds and the storm. On the flip side of that, I think it's important for us to note, finally, make sure that you're actually doing uh, what you are doing is God's will and not your own. I'm gonna tell you something that might be shocking to some of you in four words. You can be wrong. (laughs) And then you go, no, no, this is the Lord's will. I know it's the Lord's will. I felt, ooh, don't go with your feelings. Feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. God's word is the only thing worth believing, as Martin Luther said. And be careful, because folks, we can quickly fall into either emotional uh, situation or perhaps we thought that's what the text said. The text didn't say that. Be very careful with this. 1 Peter 4, 15 and 16 talks about suffering and making sure we're suffering rightly. He says this, let none of you suffer as a murderer, meaning somebody who perhaps hates somebody, because that's what a murderer does, or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Yet if anyone suffers as as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. I will never forget for me age 30. It was a few years back. I had become a headmaster at a a school. It's very hard um, job. If you know people that are superintendents or principals, it's not an easy job. You're having to uh, please parents and the board and the school and the kids. It's very, very difficult. Um, sometimes we would have issues that I said, I'm going to die on this hill. Um, there was um, particular times where uh, people came to me and said, I think this should be our Bible curriculum, but it wasn't very solid. And I would say, I'm sorry, I, I'm not going to do that. And I'll die on that one. That's fine. Put me in the, put me in the uh, whatever situation, but I'll, I'll die on that. And that, then there were t- times, though, I stood against things that there were just not biblical issues. They were more procedural. And sometimes when I worked with a board, I have regrets that I was like, no, thus saith the Lord, when it wasn't thus saith the Lord. So beware. Make sure you're actually following the Lord. You're in the will of God. I realize your emotions and your traditions can taint how you read the Bible. Thus, the importance of having no Lone Ranger Christians. You, you need to make sure in running your interpretations past others. We are the body of Christ. I am not the body of Christ. We are Does it mean we all can't be wrong at times? But yeah, overall, yeah, the Holy Spirit, yes, works in all of us. So we need to make sure that we're doing the will of God. And it's lined out scripturally. It's very clear. And in this case, they were in the will of God. And they saw Jesus walking on the sea. Liberal scholars have said, well, what they actually saw is Jesus walking by the sea. He wasn't (laughs) walking. And they were scared to death? No. You're scared to death when somebody's walking on water towards you. And Jesus, in all likelihood, was wearing white. So no wonder they thought he was a ghost. It's not seen in this text, but I'm going to take you to Matthew. Can you turn with me to Matthew? We're going to look at Matthew 14, and we'll read that. Matthew 14, verse 22 through 33, which gives us a little fuller picture of what was going on. Matthew 14, 22 through 33. It says, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them 
walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. Look up here. In the Greek, it uses the, the word, not cry, but, but it's, the, it's the Greek word for screech, the way a bird would cry out so loud. So it's not like they were going, ooh, what is that? No, they were, get the idea, they were screaming for their lives at this point. Continuing on, but when they, uh, verse, uh, yeah, uh, sorry, verse 28, and Peter, no, sorry, verse 27, but immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, oh, you have little faith. Why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshiped him, saying, truly, you are the son of God. Huh. What happened why did they not recognize Jesus? Well, number one, I've never seen anyone walk on water. If you walked on water, I might call you a ghost too. Um, but secondly, I think we see something else here. The people's fears had clouded their thinking. Their fears had mastered them at that point. How quick we are to forget the Lord's mercies. Um, and you might think it's so fascinating. Verse 28, Peter in his impetuousness, he says, if it's you, just call me out. <laughs> and he says, come. And so Peter does fine until he starts to look at the winds. And obviously you can't look at wind. So he's looking at the winds aspect upon the waves. What is he seeing, folks? He's seeing the circumstances of life instead of the author of the circumstances of life. We need to be mindful of that. You see, we fail to know Jesus walking on the sea. John 1, 3 says this, all things were made through him and without him was not anything that has been made. No circumstance in life that hits you today has not been made by the Lord or allowed by the Lord. And we need to note this, the Lord can and does suspend the law of nature. Jesus could have easily come to them walking on air, but he chooses water. And what a comfort that is to us. One of the, my favorite hymns, I think I mentioned before, is Be Still My Soul, written by Katharina von Schlegel in 1752. And one of the phrases that refers to this same chapter says this, Be Still My Soul. Your God will undertake to guide the future as he has the past. Your hope, your confidence, let nothing shake. All now mysterious shall be bright at last. Be still, my soul. The waves and winds still know his voice who ruled them while he dwelt below. They still hear his voice. So, verse 20 and 21, back to John now. We'll finish this lesson. John 6, verse 20 and 21 But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. Then they were glad to take him into the boat and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. You may have seen this. Matthew 14 adds that Jesus also said, take heart. Or we could translate it as be of good courage. And then he says, it is I. In the Greek, it says, ego eimi. And if you're familiar with that phrase, ego eimi is actually the name for God. It means I am. When God appeared to Moses and Moses says, who shall I say sent us? And God says, I am. I am who I am. And so that phrase, I am, can mean the name for God. In chapter eight of John, verse 24, Jesus says, I am. And they will know that he's referring to himself as God. Is that what he's doing here with his disciples? Take heart. And he's saying, I'm God. Uh, he could be. He could be, but remember the context. It's also used as a way to identify oneself. Remember, they thought he was a ghost. And Jesus is saying, I'm not a ghost. This is me. 
And we see in Matthew 14, 33, they then worshiped him. This is the first time we see this in the gospels. They say, truly you are the son of God. What is most convincing to the apostles that Jesus is God? He walks on water <laughs> and they fall before him and worship. So at that point, they're glad to take him into the boat and immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. What's going on there? One of two ways to look at it. And the commentators are kind of split one way or the other. Number one, as soon as they got him in the boat, it's very clear that the waves and the winds cease according to the other passages. And so they realize the maker of the sea is with them. And so when they got to shore, it was lickety split. I got there fast. And I'm sure they were just relieved. They looked, looked around and they're like, oh, we're on land. That's awesome. I'm more of the opinion that this is another miracle of transporting them immediately to their desired location. My view is Jesus got in the boat and as soon as he got in the boat, the waves and the winds died and then they look around and they're at shore. How did that happen? Unbeliever, speak, speak to you frankly. You are dealing with the storms of life in this world, but you shouldn't look forward to the next one, which is the eternal storm of life. It won't be waves and winds. It'll be sulfur and fire. It's gonna be eternal. Um, there is a way out of this room that's crushing you. And that is trusting in Jesus Christ alone for your salvation. Realizing that you are a sinner deserving of the wrath of God. It's coming. And yet... Christ laid down his life on the cross and rose from the dead so that you would trust in him for your eternal life, for your salvation in God. It's found in no one else except for in Jesus Christ. Come to him today. If you're a believer, then you should note the storms of life are just part of living in a fallen world. Some of you have fought it, perhaps like me, for years. If I could just get set, if I should get past this trial, if I should, oh, then... What? You're going to fall into a different trial. It's the way it works. J.C. Ryle, uh, 19th century pastor, says, Abraham and Jacob and Moses and David and Job were all men of many trials. Let us be content to walk in their footsteps and to drink their cup. You see, and to note this, my storms are different than yours. Your storms are different than mine, and so comparisons kill. Don't fall prey to that. There's a lot of pride when you start comparing yourself to others' storms. Don't do that. God specifically has those storms for you to make you more like Christ. Three points of application I'd give you. Number one, the Lord sovereignly put you here in your storm of life or allowed you to be there, and he knows what is best for you. Hebrews 12.10 says, you know, our parents disciplined us for a time as seemed best to them, some of you may have had rough parents and you're like, it didn't seem to be best for me, but it seemed to them. But verse 10 of chapter 12, Hebrews says, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. It is working for your good. And you're like, it doesn't feel it. Stop your feelings, please. Trust him. Number two, the Lord is with you though you cannot see him. Isaiah 43, verse two, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. He's with you. And number three, until the Lord saves you out of that storm, your job is to fix your eyes on him, not on your circumstances. Hebrews 12, one and two, therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us also lay aside every encumbrance in the sin which so easily entangles us and let's run with endurance the race that is six, sorry, set before us, fixing, I like that term, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. It's really hard for us with things like cell phones and technological age that we live in to fix our eyes on anything. My encouragement is to break away from some of this stuff so you can fix your eyes 
on him. Now, I told you I'd close with this, and I'm going to try to be a man of my word. Jeff, you said that Jesus protects his people. I know I've lost loved ones, some through tragedies that Jesus has not protected. How do you explain that? Well, you need to make sure you're getting your theology right. Luke 21, Jesus says in verse 16, some of you they will put to death. You will be hated by all for my name's sake. But then verse 18, he says, yet not a hair of your head will perish. Now, I'm not a smart man, but I know a couple of things. When a person says, you're not, you're gonna die. And then two verses later says, not a hair of your head will perish. That don't square. But it does square. What does it mean by perish? It doesn't mean you're not gonna die for Christ's sake. You might. Some of my favorite uh, characters in church history are the Scottish Covenanters in the 1600s. Um, they fought the English in particular because uh, the English were telling them that Christ is, is not the head of the church, but the King of England. He's the head of the church. And they would say, well, Christ is head, but the King of England is the head of the church. And the Scottish Covenanters got together and made a covenant and said, no way is the King of England the head of the church. We have elders or bishops in particular churches that we are submit to, and then Christ. The king is not taking a role that he should not take. They stood up against uh, the government, and rightly so. A book on it I enjoyed. I'll read you the stories that we conclude with a guy named Hugh McHale. Hugh McHale, and it shows you a story of a guy who finishes strong and not a hair of his head perished but he did die for the Lord and Jesus protected him the entire time. One of the comments said about the Scottish Covenanters, just to get you a flavor of what these people are about, as one is looking at his buddy in the prison and they're about to die for Christ, he says this, brother, die well. It is the last act of faith you will ever be able to do. Oh. Verse, not verse, Page 21, this poor guy named Hugh McHale was captured uh, for being a covenanter and taking a stand for Christ. And they gave him the boot. And if you go, what does that mean? They kicked him out? No, the boot was, if you heard that name, it would give you chills up your spine. A guy named Sir Walter explains it. He gives a vivid description of that cruel instrument. It was an instrument of torture. The executioner would enclose the leg and knee within a tight iron casing. And then he would place a wedge of that same metal between the knee and the edge of the machine. He took a mallet in his hand and he stood waiting for further orders. So they basically they've got your leg and in this iron encasement and they put an iron implement between the encasement and your leg and he's got a mallet in hand. And what is he about to do? He's about to destroy your leg. Hugh McHale was placed within this hell-invented instrument and the brutal wedge was driven home 11 savage times until his leg was smashed and pulpy. But no word of betrayal or of accusation of his brethren stained the lips of the young covenanter. Point, I'm not giving anybody away. I'm not telling you anything. We are gonna stand for Christ. So they condemned him to death. As he is limping and they're carrying him past the toll booth, down to the toll booth, where they would keep the prisoners. There were large crowds who openly wept as they heard about his death sentence. But note his response. Trust in God, he told them. Trust in God. Getting a fleeting glimpse of a well-known friend, he shouted in ecstasy, how good is the news? Four days from now, I get to see Jesus. In prison, a merry thrill of joy was about him making him humorous in serious hours. Someone asked him how his crushed leg was faring. He smilingly replied that the fear of his neck was making him forget his leg. <laughs> that they were about to hang him. Well, on the day of his death, four days later, he climbs the ladder up the rope. And as he climbed, he cried out to the people, I care no more to go up this ladder and over it than if I were to go home to my father's house. 
Rung by rung, he called aloud. Every step is a degree to heaven, near to heaven. Sitting at the top of the ladder, he took out his pocket Bible, and after addressing the crowds, he read from the last chapter of it. Standing up, uh, the napkin or cloth was put over his face, which is what they would do, but lifting it in a remarkable voice of faith inspired, he burst forth into an ecstatic offering of farewells and welcomes, saying, now I leave off to speak any more to creatures, and I turn my speech to thee, O Lord. Now I begin my communication with God, which shall never be broken off. Farewell, father and mother, friends and relations. Farewell, the world and all delights. Farewell, meat and drink. Farewell, sun, moon, and stars. Welcome, God the Father. Welcome, sweet Lord Jesus, mediator of the new covenant. Welcome, blessed spirit of grace, God of all consolation. Welcome, glory. Welcome, eternal life. Welcome, death. At that point, they hung him, December 22nd, 1666. He was 26 years old. Does Jesus really protect his people in the midst of storms? I think you have your answer. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the gift of the storms. If we're supposed to not just give thanks in all circumstances, but for all things, as it says in Ephesians 5, then we thank you, Father, for these storms of life. Some of these people in today have gone through them for years upon years, and perhaps your hand is not lightened. But Father, help them to see with the eyes of faith, these are the exact storms that are carrying them on to the heavenly bliss of the Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, if there's anybody in here who does not yet know Jesus as Savior and Lord, grant them that today. Break their knees, Lord, that they for the first time would bow before the Lord of heaven and earth. And for the rest of us, Lord, we pray that you would grant us relief, and not just relief, but most importantly, trust in these storms of life, knowing that you come to us, your time and your way. Help us to trust you, Lord. Would you? In your son's name we pray it, amen.